morning and welcome to Rising. You know, they say that three's a crowd, but here <laughs> and on our show, we don't believe in this elite consensus mainstream media nonsense. So now have both Nomiki and Amber joining me today. Very excited to uh, have you all part of the discussion. Let's get to it. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange spoke publicly this week for the first time since being freed from a high security UK prison in June. He addressed a hearing at the Human Rights Committee of the Council of Europe in France. The whistleblower revealed he's still exhausted, recovering from being in prison for nearly 14 years. Here's what he had to say. The transition from years of confinement in a maximum security prison to being here before the representatives of 46 nations and 700 million people is a profound and a surreal shift. The experience of isolation for years in a small cell is difficult to convey. It strips away one's sense of self, leaving only the raw essence of existence. I am yet not fully equipped to speak about what I have endured. <clears throat> the relentless struggle to stay alive, both physically and mentally, Assange applauded the Obama Justice Department for not indicting him, but that changed in 2017. Watch. The United States had never before prosecuted a publisher for publishing or obtaining government information. To do so would require a radical and ominous reinterpretation of the US Constitution. In January 2017, Obama also commuted the sentence of Manning who had been convicted of being one of my sources. However, in February 2017, the landscape changed dramatically. President Trump had been elected. <coughs> he appointed two wolves in MAGA hats, Mike Pompeo, a Kansas congressman and former arms industry executive as CIA director, and William Barr, a former CIA officer as U.S. Attorney General. Assange was apprehended in 2010 after his site WikiLeaks released hundreds of thousands of U.S. classified documents on the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. It was considered the largest security breach of its kind in U.S. military history. In the years following his detention, he bounced around from prison in Britain, then fled to Ecuador's embassy, where he stayed for seven years before being pulled out and transferred to London's Belmarsh Top Security Jail for skipping bail. Joining us now to discuss is Julian Assange's brother, Gabriel Shipton. Gabriel, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Yeah, good to be with you. Sure. So let's get right into it. This is the first time that Julian has been speaking publicly since being released from prison in this deal. And he says notably... I pleaded guilty to doing journalism. I mean, the unprecedented nature of this, uh, are, should we expect more from him in terms of what he endured, um, a defense of WikiLeaks? This truly is, I think, such a malpractice from the U.S. government that I'd like to hear more from him if, if he's open to, to speaking out. Yeah, certainly. Well, Julian has now rejoined public life. This is his first uh, outing uh, in the public since he was released from uh, prison uh, a few months ago. Uh, he did. Uh, he pleaded guilty uh, to a single conviction under the Espionage Act, and this committee in the in the Council of Europe uh, was formed. And the and yesterday they actually voted. the The entire Council of Europe voted on the findings of the committee that this conviction under the Espionage Act is actually a threat uh, to journalists uh, and the public's right to know uh, all through uh, all through the Europe, all through Europe and, and the representative countries of the Council of Europe. So I think that's significant uh, that these parliamentarians see it as a, press, a threat to press freedom, press freedoms in Europe. And I think we'll see uh, reciprocal type proceedings, hopefully in the US Congress, uh, you know, looking into this, looking into this unprecedented na nature of this Espionage Act conviction and what it means to the First Amendment in that in in your country, in the United States. Yeah. So I expect we'll see more of these hearings, more of these investigations into uh, what actually went on. Uh, you heard from Julian speaking about the CIA plots that were initiated under then CIA Director Mike Pompeo, plots to 
uh, assassinate Julian while he was in the embassy, plots to kidnap him uh, that made it as high as the Trump White House at the time. So there is definitely a lot to investigate and a lot to dig into uh, over the last uh, years in what happened to Juli Julian. Very much so. Uh, his phrasing, Julian's phrasing that he used there, I thought was so interesting. Wolves in MAGA hats with reference to Pompeo and Barr. So am I to take it then that, that what he sees the problem is a sort of behind the scenes, entrenched federal government, um, the, the G-men, this what some people call the deep state, operating on their own with their own agenda, independent of perhaps Trump or whoever the political figure is, that seems to me what his framing um, suggests, and I wonder if you have any more insight into that. Well, I, you know, it's a good point, uh, Robbie, and I think we can see the actual, there was no change in the position of uh, the Biden administration. This conviction came under the DOJ uh, of the Biden administration. So you have that sort of uh, flow on from a, you know, Bill Barr, Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, who initiated this uh, prosecution uh, to a Merrick Garland DOJ who uh, finished the job. So I think there is a strata of, of people in the US, US in, in both US administrations uh, who really want uh, to go after people uh, who are exposing information in the public interest, particularly uh, information that relates to the intelligence community or uh, the endless wars that are, that are going on around the world uh, and the involvement of the of the U.S. military in those. So I think there definitely is a uh, a strata of people in, in these institutions. Uh, Julian referred to two individuals in particular, uh, but but they do uh, exist in, in both administrations. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about uh, what happened when the plea deal was struck and and what occurred when there was this trade off in the Mariana Islands. I mean, it was straight out of a movie, uh, his whole life is straight out of a movie, uh, but I'm, 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 especially in relation to the supposed deep state, I found it quite interesting that Julian mentioned the Defense Contractor Association uh, that uh, these MAGA figures had, and did that assert any pressure against the Biden administration, DOJ, in that there is this, this, this pushback against the Trump's uh, role in the DOJ and his administration officials versus uh, the Biden administration. Sure, America is America, and and we all have you know our own national security interests that our, our lawmakers push forward. But the timing of that and the plea deal seemed very interesting. Um, and I'm just curious if you could illustrate a little bit more about why that happened then and and how it uh, played out behind the scenes. Yeah, well, I guess. This whole, Julian's whole saga and his whole persecution is Hollywood fodder, right? You've got uh, CIA plots, uh, you know, the Ecuadorian government involved, his time in the embassy, uh, the spying in the embassy that went on, uh, high-definition cameras installed and and, and uh, ultra-sensitive microphones and, and, and that material being sent back to headquarters in the United States every 15 days. Uh, so there is... Uh, there is a lot to talk about, and uh, I'm sure it's going to make a great film and 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 a very good book uh, one day. Uh, I think what really points to uh, the conviction uh, that Julian had to agree to in exchange for his freedom, that one conviction under the Espionage Act, was that the very same day uh, James Clapper uh, came out and said that uh, he was happy with this conviction and that uh, they wouldn't have expected any more jail time had Julian been convicted uh, in, in uh, had Julian gone and, and fought in front of the courts in the United States. So he did receive uh, a, jail, a sentence, which was five years uh, that was time served that he did in a maximum security prison in London. But I think that speaks to exactly what, uh, what we're talking about here is uh, James Clapper coming out and giving giving the conviction uh, that rubber stamp, saying that the intelligence community actually got what they wanted here. They got that restriction uh, of the Constitution, uh, that the First Amendment doesn't actually apply if you're publishing uh, this type of national defence information. 
Has there been any talk of him receiving a pardon for his actions, given that there so many of us feel that this was an act of journalism? And, and also, could you just briefly tell us before we let you go, you remember his family, if it, is his health recovering or things of that nature? Yeah, he's getting a lot of sunshine. He's spending time with his kids now. Uh, yeah, it's a very different world for him uh, to, to come to terms with, uh, being a father to two small children, five and seven-year-old, my nephews. Uh, so, yeah, he's getting back onto the on the road to recovery. Uh, he's looking much better now than, than when he came out. I think he still needs a lot of time to sort of rest, recuperate, and just really come to terms uh, you know, with what went on uh, and, and get back into a sort of normal mode of life, get out of that survival mode that he's been in uh, for the last 14 years. Uh, we are pursuing a pardon. The the, the campaign is uh, continuing and uh, pursuing a pardon for Julian. I think that would be a way for either administration to send a clear message uh, to those who pursued this prosecution, like the Pompeos, the Clappers uh, of of the world, uh, that this is a futile exercise, that even if you do uh, try and use the Espionage Act to go after these people, uh, we're going to reverse that. So don't waste your time in future. So I think it would be a pardon for press freedom uh, in, in that sense, and a strong signal that either administration uh, stands up for freedom of speech and press freedoms in the United States. And really briefly, before we let you go, have you spoken to either of the presidential campaigns in the past months since this plea deal was reached? Uh, I haven't spoken directly to e either of the campaigns. I've spoken to our supporters uh, in, in the Congress on both sides of the aisle, and they are very keen to uh, support a, a, a pardon bid uh, for Julian. Obviously, there's uh, people uh, in uh, President Trump's camp who, are, who have been uh, saying that they would, uh, such as Robert Kennedy Jr., who was part of his campaign, uh, said that he would pardon Julian on day one of his presidency. Uh, now he's part of, uh, you know, he's sort of joined forces with President Trump now. Uh, so I, I hope he's advocating with uh, President Trump for a pardon for Julian. Uh, but we'll also be focusing on uh, the Biden administration uh, and getting the civil liberty groups and also all the journalists out there who could be advocating and, and explaining to the Biden administration uh, why this pardon actually matters uh, to journalists and the press freedom community as a whole. Mm. Gabriel Shipton, thank you so much for joining us. Always a pleasure and we're glad to hear you doing much better. Seattle New York Mayor Eric Adams is lashing out at Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. He says the charges against him are all because he spoke out against the administration's immigration policies. That said, it's not looking good for the mayor. His honor could face an expanded indictment with additional defendants from his circle being charged, say prosecutors Hagen Scott, Hagen Scotton on Wednesday. Now, people heckled Adams Wednesday as he returned to a Manhattan federal court in the case accusing him of taking bribes and also illegal campaign contributions. Scotton told the judge, Dale Ho, the team will likely file a superseding indictment that means more defendants or charges will be tacked onto the original indictment. Adams denied any wrongdoing, pleading not guilty to conspiracy, wire fraud, and bribery charges in his historic arraignment last Friday. Meanwhile, Jumani Williams, the person next in line to become mayor if Adams resigns, is also caught up in the scandal. According to the Wall Street Journal, Williams accepted political contributions from a donor named in Adams' indictment. The donor, Uzbek American construction contractor, Tolib Monsarov gave $5,000 to Williams' re-election bid. The Brooklyn-based Monsarov allegedly had two of his employees donate to Jamani Williams. Monsarov allegedly reimbursed his employees for making campaign contributions to Adams and Williams. This would be illegal. Surprise, surprise. The indictment reveals he also poured $10,000 to Williams' 2022 gubernatorial run, which he lost to Governor Kathy Hochul. The documents also show Adams' office helped Mansarov plan events celebrating his Uzbek heritage. The prosecution says he got that help from Adams to resolve a stop work order that the city building's department had imposed on one of Mansarov's building projects. Rising reached out to Williams' office and have not heard back. So... 
it is looking bad, not just for Eric Adams, but for <laughs> his immediate uh, successor is also involved in this uh, corruption. Um, historic day. Indeed, yeah. It seems like it's just a steady drip, drip, drip of new allegations against Mayor Adams. And uh, there have been some people on the right, we talked about this last week, who have been saying, well, the timing is interesting because he criticizes the Biden administration's immigration yeah. policy and says that he needs more resources because of the crisis that's come to New York City. And then he gets indicted. But the allegations go back as far as, I believe, 2014. Yeah, and they put so the wheels in motion on this thing. They were thing. investigating, yeah. I think, well before he made any comments about the migration crisis, as much as I agree with him in his criticism of the Biden administration. That's not a cover for just, like, taking bribes. <laughs> he also was making that claim because there's this dynamic always between the governor and the mayor and who's in charge of what. And the one thing is that they, both of them were criticizing the Biden administration because they didn't have resources, which was convenient. And he's a little bit more conservative. He was a former Republican. Republican. Uh, he was a police lieutenant and, you know, his his whole campaign was running on making the city safer after a peak of, of incidents that occurred, you know, during the pandemic and afterwards. I think what's fascinating about this is, you know, you're right. This has been under investigation for a long time. There is a campaign finance system in New York City, a matching fund system. It's uh, supposed to level the playing field. We've talked about this in the past. But the rules are very strict because if you're going to receive money from the city, which is today, if you raise um, $250 or less from a New York resident, you are entitled to get $8 from the city if you reach a certain amount. Mm -hmm. So to show that, you know, you've got movement support, small dollar support. And there's all these people who do these schemes, and they always get in trouble. But what first happens is the CFB, the Campaign Finance Board that oversees it, they do an investigation. And if it starts to escalate, they bring in other authorities, which quietly investigate. So what I find fascinating about this with Eric Adams, it's been going on for a while. You're correct. Years. I mean, he was the Brooklyn Borough president before he was mayor, and that's when they probably started to look into this. But with uh, the other donation, um, I find really interesting is it's a $5,000 donation when Jumani Williams received matching funds, there are limits. You can't receive $5,000 in donations, just in general. If you choose to opt into the matching fund system, you can't take big money. That's the exchange. Mayor Bloomberg decided not to do matching funds because he was rich and he, had, he wanted to self-fund. Right. So you have that choice. You either go big money or you go small money and you get this amazing system. So a $5,000 donation is definitely against the rules. But in the situation with Eric Adams and, and Jumani Williams, it's bizarre that this donor had given money to other folks to, to give donations. You can't just figure that out online. You can't get that in a disclosure. That means somebody's been investigating. That means that the feds are involved in looking to who these donors were and how they gave the money. I mean, anytime that comes up in any straw donation scheme, it's always because the feds are involved. Yeah, I'm... A little sympathetic to the reality that, you know, campaign finance law is confusing, and if the authorities look hard enough at probably any political figure, they can find something not done properly. But in this case, like, right, him or his surrogates are responding to messages from foreign powers saying, here's how we will make it look like this was legit with the, with the plane flights. Well, you can't just charge us what it, charge us an amount that would make sense for a plane flight. That shows willful participation participation in this scheme for, yeah, for small amounts of money over and over and over again. Um, but that, that does not make it not serious. And, and just, uh, no, so that is a separate thing from the campaign finance right. situation. The campaign finance board, you actually have to hire when you're running for office people who specialize in this. And it is really complicated. You've got to have receipts. I mean, they'll mark you for anything. You're not going to go into an investigation if you don't have a receipt for something, but you'll probably have to pay a fine or you know, pay back the city a little bit amount of money. I mean, every candidate has to go through their audit and, and usually they have to pay a little bit of money back because there's some messiness in a campaign. But with that situation with Turkey, that's foreign influence. And there are four other countries involved in that. So suddenly you go from having a bribery scheme to a foreign influence scheme, and you're in Menendez territory. You're in a completely different type of investigation. And you know it's embarrassing for the city because what they wanted was to have their building, Turkey wanted this building, um, their consulate, across from the UN, built. And they were violating uh, you know, secure, all sorts of violations. And the, the fire department wouldn't approve it, um, which is also a problem with Turkey. Because if you remember that huge earthquake that happened a couple years ago, a lot of those buildings fell because Turkey didn't have safety precautions for their buildings, mm. and they were violating code. So they clearly don't care about 
building codes and they'll do whatever <laughs> it takes to, I mean, there's a million buildings in New York City. Like, it's not that hard <laughs> to follow through with code. You know, I don't see as many conservatives defending Eric Adams as, as maybe there was a flurry of that a week or so ago. Um, I wonder if the right has maybe come to its senses and is backing off this one a little bit. I, I mean, I don't know why he would be their hero anyway, because when it came to his criticisms of the migrant crisis, it was, give me more money, not change your policy, right. which is what conservatives would actually want to see if they wanted border security. Um, and then on everything else, like he's a liberal. I mean, he hasn't really done much to address crime, which uh, obviously conservatives shouldn't be happy about. So making him their ally is bizarre to me. But I also feel like Eric Adams is like the worst of both worlds when it comes to a corrupt public official. There's like two routes you can go where you kind of get a little bit of respect, right? So you can go <laughs> I love the, that. <laughs> you can go the Menendez, George Santos route where you're just totally unapologetic. You're using your campaign funds to buy Botox. You're a character. You've got gold bars in your <laughs> safe, like make it interesting, be funny, yes. whatever. Good movie ideas, right, from these two individuals. Or you can be like a Mayor Daly or one of these like Democrat power mayors where, yeah, you give contracts to your friends occasionally and you get a kickback, but the city is better overall and you have crime under control and things are running on time and people are like, okay, we can deal with a little bit of like mob ties so long as the city is organized. Mayor Eric Adams managed to do neither of those. And so for me, it's just, it's totally worthless. You know, one fourth thing, I just remember that that's, that's so great. I love it. Like, you could teach a class in this. Like, how you do corruption, the fun way or the... But yeah. Mayor Adams is a little kooky. I mean, he is somebody who's known for being the nightlife mayor. He shows up at the, this this uh, private club in the city and he schmoozes with people. He goes to, he says he's a vegan, but then they found meat in his fridge and he says it was a son's. Um, he got on a- <laughs> What? <laughs> True story. I mean, he's, he's very entertaining. He got on a plane. Um, there's a crypto billionaire named Brock Pierce who lives in Puerto Rico and every election, right after the election, there's this conference that every New York politician, anybody in politics goes to called Somos. And it's really supposed to be about like issues, but of course it's just one giant party and also where people schmooze and negotiate stuff and cut deals. And so he flew on Brock Pierce's, this crypto billionaire's private jet to Puerto Rico. And that hasn't even come up yet. That is also not legal. Like there are things that just happen in the press publicly. Like you don't even need to investigate it. It's just not legal. And, you know, it's, it's, and he's given money. And um, Brock Pierce is also tied to some of those uh, developers in Brooklyn, which is an interesting part because both Jamani Williams and Eric Adams are from um, this area of Brooklyn that they had overlapping support because in New York, everything's like neighborhood support and, and demographics. Like, do you have this demographic behind you? Are you a Queens politician? Do you have the Queens machine, the, the Brooklyn machine? So they both came out of the Brooklyn machine. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see what else is overlapping because mm -hmm. We were going to have a special election if he steps down, and Jumani Williams will be the, the mayor, the sitting mayor, the acting mayor. It's likely he's going to run in the special election, it seems. But there's also people like Andrew Cuomo, uh, Scott Stringer, a former controller, the current controller, Brad Lander, um, Zohar Madavi is an assembly member, uh, uh, there's uh, Jessica Ramos. There's like 20 names, and there's like seven leftists, and there's now ranked choice voting. So this is going to be... This is just the beginning. It's going to get wild it's and nasty. It's wild to think of Andrew Cuomo making another run at authority and leadership in New York. We will certainly be paying close attention to that. Lots more rising to come. Stay tuned. Robbie, what's on your radar? Well, toward the end of Tuesday night's vice presidential debate, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz argued with Senator J.D. Vance about former President Donald Trump's efforts to remain in power following his 2020 election loss. Trump's conduct was indefensible, and thus Vance did not do a very good job defending it. Rather, he attempted to turn the tables on Walls, accusing the Democratic ticket of disrespecting the most important Democratic norm of all, free speech. He said, quote, you guys attack us for not believing in democracy. The most sacred right under United States democracy is the First Amendment. Now, Vance went on to accuse Walls of wanting to criminalize misinformation, referencing previous inaccurate comments the governor made about exceptions to the First Amendment. At that point, Walls actually interrupted Vance and claimed that the First Amendment does not protect misinformation or threatening or hate speech. 
It's a damning non-answer for you to not talk about censorship. Obviously, Donald Trump and I think that there were problems in 2020. We've talked about it. I'm happy to talk about it further. But you guys attack us for not believing in democracy. The most sacred right under the United States democracy is the First Amendment. You yourself have said there's no First Amendment right to misinformation. Kamala Harris wants to oh, use the power of speech. government and big tech to silence people from speaking their minds. That is a threat to democracy that will long outlive this present political moment. I would like Democrats and Republicans to both reject censorship. Let's persuade one another. Let's argue about ideas and then let's come together afterwards. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater. That's that's the test. That's the Supreme Court test. Tim, fire in a crowded theater. You guys wanted to kick people off of Facebook for saying that toddlers shouldn't Senator, wear the masks. Senator, the governor does that's have the floor. Fr- Sorry. Fire in a crowded theater. That is criticizing the policies of the government, which is the right of every American. Senator, the governor does have the floor for one minute to Please. respond to you. Yeah, well, I don't run Facebook. So in other words... According to Walls, misinformation, threats, and hate speech are all unprotected categories of speech. Now, the governor is mostly very wrong there. He is correct to note that true threats of violence lack First Amendment protection if they are specific enough. Misinformation and hate speech, however, are absolutely protected by the First Amendment. While the former is a relatively new category of expression facing explicit calls for censorship, misinformation, the latter category, hate speech, has been exhaustively litigated before the Supreme Court. Now pay attention to what Walls said there. He had defended his position by glibly asserting that it is constitutionally impermissible to yell fire in a crowded theater. He said that's the Supreme Court standard. And it's an often expressed sentiment. We hear it all the time. It's also completely and utterly false. Let me say that again. It is false to say that that is the standard. It comes from a Supreme Court opinion, an odious opinion, in the 1919 case Schenck versus the United States, in which the majority did held, in that case, the government could stop people from distributing leaflets opposing World War I. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes likened such activism as akin to yelling fire in a crowded theater. In other words, he believed that raising doubts about the desirability of U.S. participation in such a global catastrophe was dangerous and could be prohibited by government. Today we recognize that right to criticize U.S. military policy and oppose foreign wars is obviously an essential component of the First Amendment. And today the Supreme Court agrees because Schenck was gradually overturned by subsequent First Amendment related decisions. The right to engage in speech that the government might deem reckless dangerous or hateful, was explicitly affirmed in the recent case in 2017, Mattal v. Tom, in which Justice Samuel Alito observed, quote, the proudest boast of our free speech jurisprudence is that we protect the freedom to express the thought that we hate. In other words, hate speech could not be more simple than that. Hate speech is protected by the First Amendment. People should stop saying otherwise. Now, it shouldn't be surprising. After all, if hate speech constituted unprotected speech, It would create all sorts of problems. I mean, what counts as hateful speech? It's purely subjective. Religious people, for instance, might find blasphemy to be hateful, but it's sufficiently obvious that the federal government cannot criminalize criticism of religion. Similarly, political figures might determine that their opponents running attack ads against them are examples of hateful messaging. Sometimes those messages are hateful. But if censorship was allowed on this basis, there would be no end in sight. It just doesn't make sense. Now, it's incredibly common to hear otherwise informed persons try to draw some distinction between hate speech and free speech. They are misinformed. From the standpoint of the First Amendment, there is no recognized difference. End of story. Hate speech is free speech. Misinformation is no different. The Supreme Court has not specifically taken up the question, but it should be sufficiently obvious that people can disagree on what is true and what is false. The Enlightenment principle that undergirds the First Amendment and democracy itself is that the best way to counter bad information is to allow everyone to speak. Investing some central government authority with the power to determine what is true can backfire horribly since the government is frequently wrong. Indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic provides a powerful illustration of why criminalizing misinformation is a fraught project. Time and time again, the expert consensus among government bureaucrats was proved to be flawed, incomplete, or flat out wrong. People need the right to disagree with one another and with their government. Thankfully, Americans do enjoy that protection under the First Amendment. There is no misinformation exception. I can't say it enough times. It's true that many progressive elites wish 
They had the power to censor misinformation. Take, for instance, former Secretary of State John Kerry, who recently lamented that the First Amendment was a, quote, major block to tackling this problem. Let's watch. If people go to only one source and the source they go to is sick and, uh, you know, has an agenda and they're putting out disinformation, uh, our First Amendment stands as a major block to the ability to be able to just, you know, hammer it out of existence. So what you need, what we need is to, is to win the ground, win the right to govern by hopefully having, uh, you know, winning enough votes that you're free to be able to, to uh, implement change. The tone of Kerry's remarks there suggests that he is not altogether thrilled about this situation. Winning the right to govern, does he mean winning the right to limit the First Amendment? But as he begrudgingly acknowledges, the U.S. is different from every country on Earth in that its laws significantly constrain the federal government's speech-related policy making. Walls, however, doesn't seem to recognize this fact. That's very worrying. After all, the Biden administration went to great lengths to test the boundaries of the First Amendment and pressure social media companies to engage in suppression of disfavored speech. That was the thrust of Vance's criticisms. He accused Democrats of counteracting democracy for explicitly supporting censorship on social media. Waltz could have neutralized this line of attack by affirming that the federal government cannot and should not work to forcibly remove misinformation and hate speech from Internet platforms, but he declined to do so. Worse than that, he clearly considers, Tim Walsh does, misinformation to be a form of expression that is beyond the realm of First Amendment protection, but it is not. So I was <laughs> suitably troubled by what Tim Walsh had to say there. Again, these are common misconceptions about the First Amendment. Yes, true threats of violence are not protected. Libel and slander are not protected, but these are very, very narrow categories. You can still make provocative and sometimes violent messaging, and that is protected. What is absolutely protected is hate speech because there's no category of speech that's hate speech. There's no stone tablets where they say this is hate speech and everything hateful is written down. Supreme Court has not said that. In fact, all recent decisions go against the idea that hate speech could be criminalized and misinformation is the same way. So fighting words, which is an exception, yes. and that can be interpreted in many ways. Now, I'm not saying that we often, there's a lot of things that are, are not protected under free speech that are very hard to try, and that's why they're rarely tried. Like, if you're a public persona and you have been defamed, it's almost, you know, you just, you're, it's not going to happen. You're not going to go there. Very rarely do people move forward and fight, take out, you know, it's yeah, a lot. It's, it's, I would say it's rightly difficult it's because rightly we difficult. want the bar for that to be pretty high. I mean, other countries that don't have the First right. Amendment, they have, they have libel and defamation cases all the time where it's hard to even criticize a public figure, even if you're right. I mean, this impacts journalists elsewhere. The UK, in, has, this the UK has this problem. Famously. Australia has this problem. During their Me Too moments, they couldn't say anything about people because they could get sued out of existence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. I, I work for a U UK publication, The Spectator, and so uh, unfortunately, I've become familiar with the UK laws. <laughs> of this. Not because we're out there, you know, running around publishing false reports, but because you do have to be more careful with anonymous sources and where you're getting your information from because it is a lot easier for these people to come after you and for the government to come after you. I mean, there have been reports of police showing up on people's doorsteps in the UK over social media posts. And unfortunately, we're not that far from that in the United States. I mean, we have had disinformation and misinformation, misinformation panels um, created in the Department of Homeland Security where they have been directly coordinating with social media companies to go after jokes, memes, uh, information that they deemed to be false that ended up being true. And uh, unfortunately, the first case related to this, Murphy v. Missouri, the Supreme Court found that they didn't have standing to sue. Um, but now Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is bringing up a similar case and it has at least been found by a lower court to have proper standing. The other side of this, and this is a huge, uh, vast interpretation, wild interpretation, is you know, you're not allowed to incite a coup to overthrow the, gov overthrow the government. In this modern day and age, perhaps there is an argument to be made that having a vast conspiracy of bot networks, of disinformation folks, people being paid off by, I mean, we now know that influencers, whether they are aware or not, were part of a scheme to uh, it, it basically spread disinformation to influence our elections. Now, that has not been brought forward by, as far as I know, um, by any lawyers uh, or the government. But there might be some sort of internal justification to pressure these tech, tech companies to enforce disinformation, the bots, and the foreign influence. 
uh, which they don't always do, by the way. I mean, they might be in communication because they're in communication over threats, um, over national security issues, which, you know, the tech companies should be doing that with the government. But sometimes it goes too far. I completely agree. There's there's information that's shut down that they shouldn't be shut down and they shouldn't be taking the orders of the government. But these tech companies are also not publications. They are tech companies and they have their own rules. Well, they, they have their own rules, but the First Amendment applies to them just like, you know, any other. There's no, the First Amendment does not specify journalists or media company. You know, it's, again, because I think I said this yesterday, the other day, it really, it's a limitation not on the, it's not even an affirmative right. It's a limitation on what the government can do to, to stop speech. So it's not, it doesn't depend on the status of the speaker. It's really for the benefit of the audience. You have a right to hear information or, the government has no right to stop you from hearing this information is the, is the I think, most accurate rate. Accurate but media rate companies do have a different set of responsibilities, legal responsibilities. Well, we can say they have moral responsibilities. And legal, legal responsibilities. Res well, they have legal responsibilities yeah. against defamation and those kinds mm -hmm. of things. But I would be very skeptical of even national security justifications because can we trust our government on national security you know, when we no. they redact everything we don't you know well, they redact saying, it. they're referring to intelligence that only they can see and they say this is a vital matter of national security and there's all this influence how do we even know that they're right and time and time again what ha what we've learned during their interactions with social media companies is they were making assertions mm -hmm. that such and such accounts or were bots or were foreign based and those claims made by the federal government, in some cases they were true, but they were also in many cases false. And that is my, my word. And, and Twitter, again, at the time, not run by Elon Musk, not run by a right-wing conservative figure, run by... Jack Dorsey's by, conservative. Well, the, the moderators were... Oh, I don't know if Jack Dorsey's conservative. The moderators is that Yoel Roth figure, who is yeah. very much a liberal progressive, clashing with what the FBI was telling him, saying, arguing back, saying, these are not these are not bots. These are not Russian-based accounts. These are Americans expressing their political opinions. The government was wrong about that. Well, they were making an assertion, and I think the government should be asking the tech companies to declare if, if to flag if there are bots coming from bot farms um, overseas. They should say that. I mean, whether or not they should take. But in this case, it wasn't. It wasn't. But I'm saying they made the assertion. But the tech companies should come forward and and like I said, I said this in the beginning. If we have an algorithm, if we had tech companies that didn't have didn't screw one side or have an agenda. Uh, Silicon Valley, whatever libertarian agenda it is, far right agenda in some cases, very male agenda. Libertarian agenda and the far right agenda. Right and male agenda, <laughs> that's not you. Uh, get rid of the bots. I mean, is it that hard? They know that they have bots, and I know why they don't want to get rid of the bots, because there is this illusion that there are so many users, and we know this has come forward so many times, that Twitter does not, the numbers that they are reporting in terms of users is much lower than it is once you eliminate the bots. And that's not a great look when you're a company who wants to keep bringing in the money. And by the way, Twitter's value went down drastically yesterday, like over 80%. Elon Musk is in trouble right now. So you do have to deal with these issues. Yeah. All right, we'll have more rising right after this. Stay tuned. More than 120 sexual assault lawsuits will be filed against rapper Sean Diddy Combs. Texas lawyer Tony Busby announced the civil lawsuit Tuesday. The attorney says he is representing 120 accusers who are bringing forth allegations of violent sexual assault or rape, facilitated sex with a controlled substance, dissemination of video recordings, and sexual abuse of minors. Busby says the cases were brought by 60 women and 60 men, with incidents going as far back as 1991. 25 of the accusers were minors when they were allegedly assaulted by Combs. This latest legal action follows Combs' September arrest and arraignment for charges of sex trafficking, racketeering, and transportation to engage in prostitution. Also representing the plaintiffs is Andrew Van Arsdale, an attorney who previously represented victims in a sexual abuse lawsuit against the Boy Scouts of America. Van Arsdale says 120 individual lawsuits will be filed in New York, California, and Florida within the next month. He says he's been flooded with calls. He also says that some assaults took place at Combs' infamous white parties held in New York City and the Tony Hamptons, a playground of sorts for the rich and famous. Arsdale also says that victims were as young as nine years old at the time. Van Arsdale joins us now to discuss this very disturbing story. Thank you for being with us. No, thank you guys for reporting on the story. Um, you know, it's obviously shocking uh, what we're hearing, the scope and the breadth of, uh, of what happened here. And um, really appreciate your guys' uh, uh, interest in the story, making sure the world understands what happened. Of course. Uh, let's start with that last part. Uh, nine years old. What, what can you tell us about the 
characteristics of the people coming forward? And I, I suppose I should ask, you know, what, what are you doing to vet and make sure they're not, you know, opportunistic people as well? This, uh, certainly there are a number of very legitimate accusations facing Sean Diddy Combs right now. Uh, what do you do to verify that these are people who actually were with him, that sort of thing? Right. So we were contacted by over 3,500 uh, individuals in a matter of literally 10 days. Um, we talked with them. We gathered the evidence that they could provide us showing where they were, uh, when this allegedly occurred, uh, what happened. And after going through all of those uh, uh, individuals, we ended up deciding that there's 120 people that we feel good and confident about the information they provided us to pursue these cases. Um, but it's folks that are just trying to enter into his his world, right? Um, they're trying to get TV and media opportunities. Uh, they're trying to to get music career started. Um, they're looking to to party with them, right? They were active um, in recruiting uh, young women to join them at the clubs and stay for the after parties. And so, really, they fall into two camps. One aspiring artists trying to get into the entertainment world, uh, either through media, uh, TV, or music. Uh, and two, just folks looking to to live that lifestyle with him. And um, you know, was what's been reported to us. Uh, they were served drinks. Oftentimes, these drinks were were laced with certain drugs. Um, things get really fuzzy, and they wake up in very compromising positions. And um, we're here to to stand up against that. We're here to fight against the powerful folks that may have thought that they could get away with that kind of actions and uh, say no more. We, we will not tolerate it anymore. Oftentimes with these uh, stories that come out, you learn that there's this organization, this structure that exists internally. I mean, Epstein, of course, had Ghislaine Maxwell and took people to his island and on the Lolita Express uh, and many other places in New Mexico, his other home. Is it, does it seem at this point that the Diddy operation is structured similarly or is it just parties where people would show up or do they, do they go out there and recruit? Do they have folks helping uh, keep them quiet afterwards? I've heard about the NDAs, but does it go further than that? Yeah, so a lot of the folks did sign NDAs. It was kind of required when they stayed for the after party. Oh, if you want to party with us, sign this document and uh, and, and you're fine to stay. Oh, and then after the fact, look, we have videos of you. You better not talk about this or, you know, we could ruin you uh, ruin you financially, you can ruin your career. Um, and yes, it it's very reminiscent of, of Epstein in many ways where they would recruit and these folks would travel with them. They'd go from New York to North Carolina to Miami and kind of be a part of this entourage for a while. Um, but there's also this kind of not really even a veiled threat of physical uh, force as well, right? I mean, it's like Epstein style pattern and practice with street level type enforcers uh, making sure people stayed in line. And so people were really scared. Um, they were scared to come out and speak out against him. Uh, but I think now that he's been incarcerated, uh, folks are feeling a little more safe, right? Maybe his influence over that world is waning and they feel like they can come forward and seek some form of accountability now as a result of the actions the federal government has taken against him. Who was the first individual to break this veil of silence and what led to the initial investigation? Because it seems like this started sort of slowly and then snowballed into something that no one really anticipated in terms of the size and scope. Yeah, I mean, it really, the the arrest, um, the, the indictment and the arrest, and then him being held without bail, I think was the perfect storm to allow people to feel comfortable uh, coming forward. And so literally the day after um, he was denied bail, we got our first phone call. Um, and from there, over the next 10 days, that one call, were 3,500 contacts. So it snowballed very quickly. Um, last question before you have to go. I know your time is, is tight. Part of the Epstein uh, situation was also, you know, gathering blackmail material on other powerful and influential and important people. You know, I've seen reports of celebrities very nervous about the associations they've had with Diddy and how this might reflect on them. Do we have any indication so far that there are, that that, that is also what happened here, that it's not just 
Diddy and kind of his, you know, nameless background, less famous associates, uh, associates facilitating this, but also that not just that there were high profile, maybe victims type people like Usher, et cetera, but other celebrities who were complicit in this behavior and, and maybe he has blackmail material on them. Yeah, we're, we're starting to uncover that, right? Um, through the coverage uh, this week of the announcement uh, that Tony Busby made in Houston, we've received a lot of phone calls. In fact, um, since the press conference on Tuesday, uh, my office alone has received over 14,000 phone calls. Uh, you know, there's, they run the gambit from folks that, you know, have, have issues with other people uh, to allegations against Sean Combs to a lot of folks saying, look, I was there. I have video. I have audio. Let me share it with you because uh, I want to help in this matter. So, you know, it's only been less than 48 hours. We're trying to dig out of that. We're trying to get access to all these materials. But I do think there's a lot of that type of evidence out there. And I think that, you know, the world's going to see it uh, here as we go forward. Hmm. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Tulsi Gabbard is taking legal action after claiming last month that she'd been placed on the domestic terror watch list. Gabbard said in September the, that she had been flagged as a risk at the Department of Homeland Security's Transportation Security Administration. She said that before boarding a flight on July 23rd, she and her husband were pulled aside for additional TSA screening. And on the next flights they took, their boarding passes were marked with the Quad S, which stands for Secondary Security Screening Selection. Gabbard said that on August 4th, federal air marshal whistleblowers told her she'd been added to a secret terror watch list on July 23rd, the day after President Joe Biden announced his exit from the 2024 presidential race. Now she's fighting back. The federal air marshals, uh, federal air marshal whistleblowers came forward and exposed the truth and provided evidence about how one day after I criticized Kamala Harris on a televised national interview talking about how dangerous the consequences would be if she were to serve as president and commander in chief, the very next day I was placed on a domestic terror watch list called Quiet Skies that almost nobody, including members of Congress, know much about. Given no reason why I was put on the list, there's no due process to say, hey, uh, show me what you got and take me off the list. Uh, as far as I know, the last time I asked, uh, I heard that the targeting package that the TSA built against me is still operational. Uh, I hope that Congress takes this up. I'm pursuing legal action, working with Jay Seculo and the ACLJ, Good. because I'm not the only one who is being impacted by this. There are many Americans whose names will never make headlines who have also been wrongly targeted by this administration, specifically because of their political views and their exercise of their right to free speech. On July 22nd, Gabbard said Harris was, quote, dangerous because she did not, quote, have the strength to stand up to the military industrial complex who are profiting from us being in a constant state of war. The American Center for Law and Justice says they are filing FOIA requests to the TSA, Department of Homeland Security, FBI, and Department of Justice, and are preparing to file various lawsuits. Yeah, I think we definitely need a lot more information on what happened here. Um, I have been very critical of the TSA for a long time. Indeed. Uh, it is a, I actually, in our most recent um, issue of Reason Magazine, where I also work, um, we, it was the Abolish Everything edition of the, you know, we're crazy libertarians, we want to get rid of the entire government. My contribution was abolish the TSA, which is extraordinarily wasteful, does not make us safer in any way, and in fact, routinely violates the civil liberties of all Americans, including apparently Tulsi Gabbard, who was subjected to all of these extra invasive security um, screenings. We are not sure why. She has suggested it might be connected to her political Outspo her embrace of Donald Trump and speaking out against Biden and Harris. I don't know if that's the reason. We don't know what the reason is because you don't ever get clarity from these people. Um, but it is it is nuts to have all of these extra agents following around, what like a, a prominent person who's obviously not like a terrorist or a criminal. Or it's it's just crazy to me. I, I don't buy it to be honest because. It's very clear what you don't the think they're doing is. this to Tulsi. No, I think that she, you know, we that was a random screening check, and she. So I looked it up online. It's not that hard to figure it out. Um, if you're on the no-fly list, you receive a letter, or, or you just do not receive a ticket, 
When you're on She's the not planet, on the no left fly list. This is a yeah. different For terrorism. designation. She said, I'm looking at the designations right now, that designation that she had is something that is is, is usually because they're randomly selected. And if the, when you get secondary screening, I've had it before, I'm sure you guys have too, plenty of people have. She has a right, and if she wants to find out, there is a process, and it's very simple. You ask the Homeland Security, you uh, can apply uh, to redress the inquiry program, and if you are a security threat, your lawyer can ask for the information. Instead, she's making an immediate bonanza and making it about her. And it's very popular to criticize the TSA. I get it. And she is, I believe, doing this politically. You know, plenty of people get pulled aside all the time. I don't think that the no-fly list is accurate. I think it's flawed. I think 100% of Americans are mad at the TSA. And she is using this as an opportunity, as she always does, to enhance her career and get in the media limelight and attack the Harris administration. Kamala Harris doesn't do anything with the TSA. Do we think that our dysfunctional government, the TSA, which can't get names right, is in some vast conspiracy? And they did it in one day after, after Tulsi Gabbard criticized Kamala Harris, do you think that they had this vast conspiracy to pull her aside so she couldn't get on a plane? No, if they did that, they would do something much more, you know, concrete. She's opportunistic. Tulsi Gabbard is about Tulsi Gabbard, and it has always been that case. You know, if she's on the list, then ask. Do the process. Instead, she's making it sound like she's, you know, completely being ostracized, and she, they're, they're claiming she's a terrorist. Nowhere in that quality does it say she's a terrorist. It was a random security check based on what she was listed as. Well, this is a lot more than just a second security screening, though. She says that as she's going between flights, she has basically a cabal of TSA agents. She says that following her around. It? <laughs> yes, I yes, believe it. I do believe it. Um, this, she's not the first person that this has happened to. Um, Lauren Southern, who used to work for Blaze, uh, or sorry, Rebel Media out of Canada, has talked about how she was basically stopped from flying back and forth between Australia and Canada to see her husband's family because they had uh, designated her as some kind of extra security risk. But that's not an American similar... law. That's a different law. Right, but she was also going through America at this time, too. Like, she basically wasn't allowed to fly anywhere. Um, point being, she also had the similar situation with TSA agents following her back and forth between planes and then eventually not letting her board the plane. Basically, this is not unheard of for this to happen to someone who has been critical of government officials. And I absolutely am more willing to believe Tulsi Gabbard than the TSA or the Biden-Harris Yeah, let me... Well, they haven't said anything. Uh, I, I, I don't know that it's because of her commentary, but I absolutely believe it's happening to her. It's part of the... It's not the no-fly zone. It's the Quiet Skies program. Let me right. read you a little bit about this Quiet Skies program. This is from NPR in 2018. Some Americans have been trailed and closely monitored by undercover air marshals as they travel on U.S. flights as part of this program. The air marshals take notes on, our, on the passenger's behavior. The existence of this program was, it was disclosed then, back then in 2018. Um, the air marshals expressed misgivings about this surveillance program, questioned whether it's legal and whether it's an efficient use of resources. The TSA said it's an impractical method of keeping acts of terrorism from occurring at 30,000 feet, and the program is reviewed, they say, by privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties people. So my point being, this was not, this doesn't need to be partisan or political or having anything to do with a conservative or an anti- whatever agenda. This was this is a program that liberals were furious about, correctly furious about several years ago when its existence was revealed. Um, I, I think it's ludicrous what we allow our government to do to us as we're trying to go about air travel with no additions to security, no enhancement to security whatsoever. The TSA fails all of, like 90% of their, when they when you test to see if you can actually get a knife through, you can do it. Um, not that it okay. matters if you have a knife on a plane because nobody's take, nobody's hijacking planes anymore because they lock the cockpit doors, which is the one innovation we did after 9-11 that actually solves the airport safety issue. I agree with you, but that is not what was on her ticket. And I think she's lying. Mm. All right, you tell us what you think. We've got a lot more to come. More Rising right after this. Doug Emhoff, Vice President Kamala Harris's husband, has been praised by Democrats for being a role model husband who manifests a different, softer, masculine energy. But that image may be getting more complicated. In what is an explosive allegation from the right-leaning Daily Mail, Emhoff allegedly hit a former girlfriend in 2012. Three friends of the ex-girlfriend gave the scoop to the online website. They recounted the 2012 incident occurred at a film festival in France. The story in the Daily Mail went on to say that the second gentleman slapped his ex's face so hard she spun around. 
According to the Daily Mail, one of the friends said the ex, whose name was not released, called him in tears immediately after and described the alleged assault. Rising reached out to Harris's office, but we have not gotten a response. The story was picked up by the New York Post. News Nation's Chris Cuomo weighed in on the media's coverage of this, or lack thereof, on his Wednesday night program. Let's watch. If the name were Trump instead of Emhoff, it would be all over the news. Daily Mail, echoed by the New York Post, has a story. Doug Emhoff, Kamala Harris's husband, accused of striking a woman he was on a date with at the Cannes Film Festival back in 2012. They, they had been drinking, and he didn't like how she talked to the valet. He smacked her, she smacked him back. Ordinarily, I don't care about these stories. You could say, well, there may have been an assault. Maybe. Well, she didn't go to the police. He's not really running. But again, if it were Trump or anyone related to him, it would be on every TV show that is on right now. If true, this bombshell comes right after MSNBC host Jen Psaki on Sunday dubbed Emhoff the wife guy and a mensch, a Yiddish term meaning a kind man. Let's watch. It's also been an important part or an interesting part of how people have talked about your role here is how your role has reshaped the perception of masculinity. And I'm not sure you planned on that, but you are an incredibly supportive spouse. Does Emhoff live up to the wife guy persona? Last month, Emhoff admitted to having an affair in 2008 with the nanny and teacher, Najin Naylor, whom he did get pregnant. So, this is a pretty serious accusation from many years ago, and I am someone who thinks we should reserve a certain amount of skepticism for things that only come out many, many, many years later for which there is difficulty to provide any evidence. I'm someone who believes very strongly in due process. Now, due process and the presumption of innocence are really only for the legal system. Obviously, people are free to reach whatever conclusion they want in their own personal moral judgment or even in terms of you know, fitness to serve in office, although, of course, he's not the candidate. Kamala Harris is. But I do take Chris Cuomo's point that these things seem to get taken extremely seriously, no matter how long ago they were, if the person, by the media, if the person is a conservative or Republican. Well, Trump, specifically he's talking about Trump. Trump, right. the people who've come forward. Well, but not just Trump, Trump, you know, Brett Kavanaugh, et Sure, cetera. but they, they, they are people, they have names, they're not unnamed sources. These are three unnamed sources that are friends of the woman, the ex-girlfriend. They also said, and, and this is, there's pictures from that night, uh, this was in a very crowded place. It was a really long line at the valet. Uh, you know, it was a public space. So it's interesting that three people who were not present, who were told supposedly by the woman that it had occurred, are the ones coming forward. Not the woman, not any other person who was there that night. And it's very convenient that it's coming up as we're very close to an election and they want to dismantle this beautiful uh, image, the right wing Well, I mean, it came out, the Kavanaugh stuff again, which was so much longer ago, that came out right as he was about to become, isn't it interesting, he's sure. about to become a Supreme Court justice. But there, that was a person with a name with, with evidence, okay? I'm, politics yeah, but, is politics, I mean, so was the So it. was the person who accused Joe Biden, right? Tara Reid. Yeah. She yeah. was a person with a name. And I would dispute the idea that there was evidence backing up Christine Blasey Ford's account of what supposedly happened, but um, that being said, I mean, even if we, if we look at Trump, he's having to pay a million, a multi-million dollar judgment um, based, again, on one woman's word and no actual physical evidence and a lot of actually contradictory details that put her account into question. So I think it's reasonable to say that the standards have fallen literally below the ground on whether or not we take allegations against conservatives or Republicans seriously. And in this case, I mean, do we really think that the people who were there in 2012 at Cannes knew who Doug Emhoff was? Yeah, he was a well-known entertainment attorney. The Cannes Film Festival is an entertainment film festival. I'm pretty sure people knew who Doug Emhoff was at the time. He was very involved in California politics. You know, anybody who was around that, I'm sure, and they might come forward for all we know. All I'm saying is three unnamed sources that heard it by hearsay does not hold up in court, whereas Trump's allegations went through a court process. You know, Brett Kavanaugh, he made it through, right? He made it through, and there was evidence provided, and the person, the individual who's making these claims was there, even if it was claims from dozens of years ago. I think there's flaws in that as well. But this is something that just would not hold up in court. It's kind of embarrassing. It wouldn't even hold up in a newsroom, and that's why it went to the Daily Mail. If something else comes forward, then fine. Let's have a conversation about it. 
politics is politics. People yeah, do yeah. this. There's Holding opposition the research. Story. It does, yeah. I mean, because one of this one of the individuals who's making this claim had a contemporaneous phone call from the victim, so that would give them some sort Still of credibility. Hearsay. No, it's I hearsay. agree with you. It's not like a slam dunk, but it does count more than just I heard from somebody who heard from somebody. He had a call immediately following the event from the alleged victim. Also, remember that the standard through the Me Too era that we were told That's right. by activists on this issue, a standard I thought made absolutely no sense, and I think we're all now kind of conceding that it makes no sense, was believe women believe unquestionably. All women. That's right. It, when it should have been be respectful of and, and show kindness toward and take seriously and listen and don't dismiss the way not just the media but also like the legal system mm -hmm. treat women as hysterical that would be that's totally wrong but you obviously have to have to vet and have to have enough skepticism to know that in some cases these things can be wielded in bad faith and also just that memory is not perfect and that's 100%. true in this case right. that's true in the Kavanaugh case that's true in everything because we remember things in ways that are that are you know maximally beneficial to ourselves that's just how the human brain works so the standard again which activists insisted upon and but got taken really seriously that's the crazy was part. believe all women and that was but the woman right. did not come forward this is a woman well these are other women <laughs> that weren't there that supposedly got a phone call and they won't be named it's this is weak for journalism standards. You can have unnamed sources. They are not sources. I, mean, I think weak they for journalism not sources. standards is the fluff interview that Jen Psaki did with him. Right. <laughs> I or, mean, she's a former White House communicator. Or the yeah, Time yeah, right. magazine article. Journalism standards. Yeah, well, and then we had a Time magazine article after Doug Emhoff's speech at the Democratic National Convention where they said, quote, the second gentleman gave a little master class in how to be a guy's guy as well as a wife guy. By being husbandly, this is from the New York Times style columnist, um, by being husbandly, men at the DNC lifted the yoke of wifeliness from Miss Harris's shoulders, helping her project the image of a strong leader at the head of the Democratic ticket. Yeah. I mean, this kind of slobbery coverage yeah. should be disqualifying for anybody in the media. And so when these stories come out that undercut this narrative, um, I mean, we, the pregnancy of the, the uh, nanny is confirmed, right? right? He admitted to that. Um, so to sit there and slobber over him, I believe... Was that before the DNC that that story came out? It was no, something around. Shortly about after. About. Yeah. But here's the, I, I understand. I mean, listen, the media has been praising J.D. Vance for how he spoke during the debate. It happens on all sides. Number one, Doug Emhoff's not running for office. Number two, this is a unique situation. We've never had the potential for a first man unless it was Bill Clinton, but he's a former president. Uh, you know, we've never had that potential. So we're looking at it through a different lens. And I think it is interesting to see how he, how he supports her in her career, and he keeps his career, and it is a different type of, of model for what it means to be a husband, and I think that's fair. The situation with his, 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 his affair, his ex-wife has come forward praising him as a human, Humans are humans. I mean, I am not going to have moral judgments over anybody's marriage. You have no idea what goes on in people's lives. I think that's same. fair enough, and that's actually a good thing to show publicly. Yeah, I, I, I feel the same, and I. this is not a, for me, this is not like a story about, well, the fitness of, it's not even, again, it's not even Doug Emhoff, the right. fitness of Kamala Harris. I, I hope they have a nice marriage. I hope it is as genuine as it seems to be, and they have a nice family, and that's fine, and even if they don't, I don't care. It, that doesn't factor into my, you know, my calculus for whether she should be the president whatsoever. What is revealing about it is really how it's handled by the media. Right. It's not on them, it's on it's the media. And I feel like you can't have it both ways, right? You can't say, well, he's kind of off limits because he's not running for office, but we're also going to write all these fawning pieces about how he supports sure. Kamala. Like, if you're going to be in the public eye and you're going to be seen as an asset to the campaign, then you also have to be prepared to take scrutiny as well. And up until now, and even through now, because the mainstream media hasn't covered either of these things very significantly, uh, they haven't done that. And I think it's fair to say that if you're going to be a public part yeah. of the campaign, if you're going to be doing speeches at the Democratic National Convention and helping assist in campaign events and rallies, then you have to be ready for handling the heat. I have no doubt that if there are stronger allegations that come forward with names, that the mainstream media will cover it. I think this is just because it's a crappy story based on hearsay from three people who are unnamed. It's bad sourcing, it's bad journalism, and it shows a desperation to really crack away at his his persona because the affair thing just didn't click because we're Americans and how many people in this country have affairs and it's just, we're not in the 50s anymore. We don't have this moral 
code that, yeah, I don't know if I agree I with that. I, well, <laughs> that's why you, again, I don't care. I, I think conservatives <laughs> might say, Amber might say, Amber might it's say. not <laughs> clicking because the media is put, putting no effort into covering it well, exhaustively that's the, thing, the way like, they this would Jen Psaki, This Jen Psaki interview yeah. came after the affair allegation where she's talking about how he's a softer masculinity as he did probably the most like stereotypical movie type man portrayal ever of knocking up the nanny when the wife wasn't around and then like shipping her off and she gets an abortion to like wipe their hands clean of the whole situation like the fact that she tried to reframe him as this um sort of like moral yeah. morally better man after that i think is why it's really gross but i feel like, like he's not even sure. if i was him i'd be like please stop ca to the media yeah. please stop casting right. me in the role of greatest husband who ever lived, yeah. just let me be. And it's not, <laughs> and I and I think what you were getting at earlier, like it is Jen Psaki, she's the former White House press secretary, it's not really her fault, it's MSNBC's fault and the media's fault for treating her as if she's some kind of news anchor, yeah. when she is obviously a very biased political operative. Yeah, that's but a good point. It happens on all sides, as we know. It's, it's just the state of the media today. Not everybody has a balanced show like we do. In fact, yeah. I don't think anybody does. Very few people. I will always take an opportunity to praise Rising for its diversity of thought. You don't see that <laughs> anywhere else in the media. More Rising coming up next. Former First Lady Melania Trump contradicted her husband on abortion. In a video posted on her ex account, she said there is no room for compromise when it comes to a woman's individual freedom. Take a look. Individual freedom is a fundamental principle that I safeguard. Without a doubt, there is no room for compromise when it comes to this essential right that all women possess from birth, individual freedom. What does my body, my choice really mean? The First Lady released the video following The Guardian leaking excerpts Thursday of her forthcoming book titled Melania, in which she defends women's rights. Her position is at odds to Trump's, who has voiced support for restrictions on abortion. Trump touts the Supreme Court ruling that overturned Roe v. Wade, which provided protection for abortion nationally. It led to the enactment of severe restrictions on the procedure in mostly Republican-led states. It should be noted that the former president has said he would veto a federal abortion ban if he is elected again and that the issue should be left up to the states to legislate. So Melania is a pro-choice individual, I guess. That's not so surprising necessarily to me. Look, I, I don't know that it's that big. People, couples disagree on various axes of policy. She's not required to agree with everything Donald Trump thinks. I suspect she actually agrees with very little that Donald <laughs> Trump thinks, would just be my guess. She's not a particularly political person, although she has written this book, which you know, kind of drags her into the spotlight, the limelight a little bit in terms of politics, despite her claiming to kind of just want her privacy. Um, I don't know, what do you make of this? Yeah, I, I guess I'm not that surprised by it either. I mean, she's a model. She ran in a lot of Hollywood-esque circles, which tend to be more liberal. I don't think it's all that surprising. I mean, even Trump himself has some more traditionally liberal positions than what you would typically find in the Republican Party. Right, I don't, I don't so, know that deep down in his heart of hearts he's actually pro-life. Can, can I... He knows I, that it's a... <laughs> strategic that to be the Republican leader, he has to be pro-life. Can I just run through a, a timeline of his stances on abortions over the years? I'm going to Go jump over it. a few years. October of 1999, quote, I'm very pro-choice. February 2011, I'm pro-life. 2015 in August, divided over defunding Planned Parenthood. February 2016 says uh, he'll defund Planned Parenthood while also praising the group. In March of 2016, some form of punishment for women who seek abortions. October 2016, vows to overturn Roe v. Wade. 2017, January, uh, nominates Neil Gorsuch, of course. Then uh, he supports the 20-week abortion in October 2017. And then in January through May of 2018, he advocates for a 20-week abortion ban. Then nominate, nominates Brett Kavanaugh, confirms Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, and then in 2022, in, John, in June, says, God made the decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. After the midterm losses in 2022, he blames Republicans and McConnell for not handling abortion properly. Uh, and then in September 2023, makes vague promises about an abortion compromise. Then in this year, February through March, flirts with the idea of the national abortion ban, then won't answer in April uh, about the six-week abortion ban, and then says well, in April she should go back to the I States. Mean, I, other than the initial 
changing of his mind about where he, he was pro-choice and then became pro-life, which, you know, people change their mind about policy issues. It does happen. It could be sincere. I don't know. I'm not claiming that it isn't With the a polls. sincere change. <laughs> but other than him changing his literal position on abortion itself, I don't know that there's that much in there that actually is a contradiction. Like, you can think that it is important to overturn Roe v. Wade or that Roe v. Wade was a wrongly decided um, Supreme Court decision. I actually happen to think it's not a particularly solid decision because I don't think this right is enshrined in the Constitution. Um, you can think that that was that it, changing that was important, but then it ought to be left up to the states to decide, and there should not be a federal abortion policy, and that once put under state control, something in that middle six. Two, two uh, is too early, 20 is too late. Somewhere in there will be a good policy, but the states can decide. I don't know. That seems to be where most Americans are, actually. Yeah, I mean, if you poll Americans, most of them say they want some restrictions on abortion. Most of them usually fall around the 15-week mark. That's pretty consistent. And, I mean, I think, to be fair, if we're playing both sides here, it's not like Democrats have really indicated what restrictions, if any, they would support. I mean, Tim Walz was asked this during the vice presidential debate, and he didn't answer whether or not he would support any re restrictions. Um, I mean, I wish they would just say, yeah, no restrictions. You can have an abortion whenever you want for whatever that's reason. Not the, the, that's not how most Democrats Well, then are. they should say it. I right? think every Democrat like, has a different interp the, interpretation because there's, there's other stuff happening, too. So it's not just the, the restrictive abortion laws that are occurring in multiple states, Florida being extremely restrictive, Texas as well. It's that it's a package deal with defunding women's clinics. Um, you know, uh, Planned Parenthood was on the chopping block first. Women can't get appointments now with their OBGYN in time to know that they're pregnant. So they get their pregnancy test that's sometimes six, eight weeks in, maybe even longer. Then after that, you have to get an appointment for an abortion if they're still available, if it's rape, incest, whatever the laws are. So suddenly, you have the, no woman wants to have an abortion at 22 weeks. No woman wants to have an abortion at 30, 40, whatever weeks. It's... And when that does happen, it's most likely, unless you're being delayed because you don't have access to health care in your state because it's being defunded, it's usually because there's a risk to the woman. And so I think most uh, Democrats traditionally have said rape and incest and uh, ectopic pregnancies when the woman's life and the baby's life are at risk, you know, should not be on the table at all. Sometimes there's a question over how many weeks, but we have to keep in mind these delays because of women's health are affecting when women get abortions now. And it, it doesn't, it, it's not the traditional conversation anymore. But wouldn't the response to that be funding more healthcare clinics and making sure people have access as opposed to changing the standard of what week you think people should be able to have an abortion at, right? It would be, but these are Republican-led legislatures that are cutting the access to funding. I think the fights are happening on both levels. I think well, this I, is... A, I, go, go ahead. Well, I, I just... I would say that there is a legitimate moral objection to funding clinics that provide abortions right. and people have issues with their taxpayer dollars going to things that they morally object to, right? And when you do look at the difference between, let's say, Planned Parenthood and pro-life crisis pregnancy centers that don't provide abortions, there are significantly more crisis pregnancy centers, including in low-income areas, that all women have access to. So I think the idea that you're defunding women's health because you don't want to pay for abortions is, is a little bit of a, a misinterpretation. My, my idea, because I also don't want to see on any subject American tax dollars spent on things that, you know, your tax dollars spent on something you don't believe in. Like so churches? I don't want, well, what like do you mean by that? I don't, no, I don't We subsidize churches. By not taxing yeah, them? Yeah, by not taxing them. I don't want to tax anyone. Yeah. I want to erase all taxes. So the, the crime is not that they're that. not being taxed. It's that other people are being taxed. Um, but I don't think, I mean, I don't think church should be, I don't think a religious institution should be, you know, subsidized or something of that nature. Um, my solution would be, instead of, like, funding for abortion centers or something like that, I do want to make it easier for people to get whatever the government does to stand in the way of um, uh, women having more reproductive health choices before the abortion conversation has to come in in terms of birth control and contraceptives and all of those things I would make I would get the government out of the way of that make it easier for people to plan accordingly so that we end up doing fewer abortions because it just doesn't come into play as much if we can medically technologically with innovation with free and easier choices make it so that's not even on the table I think that's better I, I hear you and I think we should just fund all around I think we should be funding you know, uh, support and education for planned pregnancies, but not you know, the majority of abortions are not just unplanned pregnancies. I mean, of course, there are there is rape and incest, and that's something that you can't 
condom your way into. A lot of abortions happen within marriages. Well, we should prosecute Sometimes, rapists. <laughs> we should. Sometimes women are taking antibiotic and their birth control doesn't work. I mean, there's so many factors at play here that we just have to keep in mind that that's why this has to be on the table. And a lot of women have abortions because, you know, they can't afford to have the child and they weren't planning it and there was an accident. Accidents happen. This We're humans at the end of the day. So we should be providing all sorts of scenarios, funding for all of it. And frankly, at the end of the day, I just think it's because... Um, some conservatives, I'm not saying you, some conservatives in the party have other agendas to really keep women as birth incubators. We'll be back with more Rising right after this. There may be some signs that incumbent Republican Senator Ted Cruz may have to fight at least harder to keep his seat. His opponent, Democrat Colin Allred, appeared to be gaining some ground in a survey released on Sunday by public policy polling, Clean and Prosperous America, Cruz led, all red, by just one percentage point. That's within the margin of error. The Cook Political Report said, quote, We still think this race remains tough for all red, and that winning those last few points in Texas will be a Herculean task. And I agree with that. Texans have not sent a Democrat to the Senate since 1988, when former presidential candidate Lloyd Benson did win the seat. Colin Allred attempted to get ahead by attacking Senator Cruz for striking down the bipartisan border bill that failed to pass Congress earlier this year, after former President Trump signaled that he was not in favor of it. One arrow in Allred's quiver, GOP Liz Cheney, is stumping against Cruz. Let's watch. I feel that this race is such an important one. Um, I have not endorsed in any other uh, Senate race this time around. Uh, but I served with Colin. I know him. I know what kind of a congressman he's been. I watched him. As you said, we were on opposite sides of, of issues and opposite sides of the aisle. Um, not every issue on opposite sides. But uh, I also know Ted Cruz. You know, I've known him for over 20 years. And uh, I know that, that he will say anything if it serves his own political purpose. And, and the nation is at a moment where we need public servants who are men and women of goodwill. Uh, who are men and women who will do the right thing. Uh, we need serious people in office. When asked if Liz Cheney abandoned conservative values, this is what she had to say. When I watch um, the kinds of things that we, we saw Ted Cruz do after the 2020 election in particular, um, his willingness to do whatever Donald Trump wanted him to do, including proposing this completely unconstitutional plan that would have resulted in throwing out electoral votes, throwing out the votes of millions of Americans, um, something that, that, as I said, was unconstitutional. So we are always hearing that Texas might go blue. I have a lot of skepticism of that. I do too. Um, but there's a reason why this, there are a couple of reasons why this race is probably closer than it should be. I mean, if we compare this to 2020, John Cornyn, the other senator from Texas, won by nearly 10 points. I think it was 9.6 percentage points. Um, actually outperforming Trump, who won by nine points in Texas during that election. Ted Cruz won against Better Work by, what, three or four points. So it was exceptionally closer than you would expect in red Texas. But for one, Ted Cruz is not very well liked, frankly. Um, he doesn't have a lot of allies in Senate Leadership Fund, in the Senate more generally, in the Republican Party. Mitch McConnell, I can promise you, is not chomping at the bit to help Ted Cruz overcome this one percentage point uh, within the margin of error supposed advantage he has over Colin Allred. Um, and he also is shackled by his longtime consultant, Jeff Rowe, who was the general consultant for the Never Back Down PAC DeSantis campaign. And he has a long history of making millions of dollars off of failed candidates, whether it was Adam Laxalt in Nevada, Kelly Kraft running for governor in Kentucky. He was on the uh, Josh Mandel in Ohio campaign, the Dave McCormick in Pennsylvania campaign. And in consultant circles, there's actually a meme going around that portrays Jeff Rowe as the Hamburglar running from Senate campaign to Senate campaign oh. to collect all this money. When he was on Never Back Down Pack, he had this grand idea to have DeSantis campaigning heavily in South Texas, thinking that he was going to replicate DeSantis' success with Latino voters in Florida in South Texas. Oh Entirely different demographics, yeah, totally. for one. <laughs> and then two, DeSantis didn't even make it to Texas. So that was like a totally harebrained wow. scheme that didn't pan out. So the fact that tech, uh, Ted Cruz is relying on this guy to run this tight race is obviously a huge problem. 
Now, I do think there's a reason to be skeptical of the idea that Cruz is going to lose. I think ultimately he'll probably pull it out by about two or three points. At least that's what I'm hearing from sources familiar with the campaign. Um, this is a, a long running sort of Democrat tactic where they do pour a lot of money into Senate campaigns that don't have a, a great chance of working, whether it's Amy McGrath in Kentucky against Mitch McConnell um, or this the better work campaign against Ted Cruz and then this current one. Um, the Cook Political Report predicted of every race they predicted in 2022, I believe, that they said was a toss up race. Every single one went to Republicans. So I do think we have to be careful about mm. that designation as well. But all of that being said, sorry for monopolizing the time. Um, the race is way closer than it should be. There's reason for Republicans to be worried. And th that's mostly from Cruz and his team's own doing. I think something interesting also is Ted Cruz has made a lot of questionable choices for somebody who's a political opportunist. I think it's pretty fair on all sides. Everyone thinks he's a political opportunist. You know, don't forget, he was that hold up on the convention floor uh, when Donald Trump was seeking his first nomination and didn't make a lot of friends that way on That's either right. side. Uh, he also... Lion Ted. <laughs> Lion Ted. <laughs> he votes against uh, his party's interests and his own interests. I mean, he, he was one of, what was it, 25 senators who voted against the PACT Act, which was a critical piece of, uh, of legislation that would have expanded health care for veterans, uh, veterans who'd been affected by, uh, you know, smoke and uh, toxic fumes. It was a bipartisan bill, very popular. There are more veterans and current active duty members in Texas than any other state by far, over one and a half million. That could affect it. The border immigration bill, hotbed issue everywhere, definitely in Texas. Ain't a good look when the Texas senator is voting against the bill that's going to strengthen the border because he's trying to woo Donald Trump. I just don't understand. He's not winning with Donald Trump. Just let it go. Be, mm -hmm. be a little bit of a maverick. Like, just do what you want to do. You have your own power in Texas. It just seems like he's not answering to the folks he needs to answer to, which are voters and, frankly, donors. I, I, I will push back a little bit on consultants. Aren't all consultants trying to make a little bit of money? Aren't they all? I mean, plenty of Jeff consultants. Jeff Rose, a special class. I promise you that. Plenty of consultants in the Democratic Party especially, fail up. I mean, well, Democrats lost 1,200 seats over eight years. Yes. A lot of consultants made money off those races. And the Democrats keep putting money into, I mean, this is like, right, they, they could win this if they did exceptionally well, but are their resources actually best spent well, trying to have a pickup in Texas other than defending some of these, like Montana, yeah. other places where... Ohio. Ohio. Nevada. Nevada, yeah. Yeah. Arizona, oh. even. I mean, that race is closer than it should be. That yeah. race is close. Yeah. I, do you think? I don't. I don't. I don't. I think. Care. I Lake's think. Pull it out. I think off. he's gonna. I, I would predict he pulls it yeah. off. They're, the independent voters in Arizona are more mavericky than they are. There are definitely MAGA people in Arizona. Well, it's enough to get the nomination. I mean, yeah, this is the Republican right. Party's quintessential problem yes. now. Is that there's a there's a, a nut, the base is big enough for the Kerry like type person to win the primary, but then and then in some states that's. Fine, that's right. enough of the overall state too. But in places like, you know, uh, Arizona, the little more um, the way there are Democrats and independents and moderate Republicans, the gap between what the primary voters demand and what people are willing to put up with is really starting to hurt. There are the more party. independents in Arizona. I mean, yeah. it is nationally now, but in Arizona, there are more independents than Democrats. I just the state of Kristen Cinema and John yeah. McCain. I yep. do think, uh, compared to the Amy McGrath scheme, though, going after Ted Cruz now, as he was already weakened in the last race, and then Rick Scott in Florida, who also does not have allies with Mitch McConnell and the Senate Leadership Fund, and he'll be on an island in terms of funding as well. It, that's marginally smarter, but it is, I think, a bad sign for their hopes of controlling the Senate that they're not investing as much in the mm -hmm. places you mentioned. Ohio, Montana, Nevada, um, Pennsylvania even. Yeah. Uh, I just always recall Lindsey Graham's famous uh, statement about Ted Cruz that if you killed Ted Cruz on the floor of the Senate oh and the trial was in the Senate, nobody would convict you. <laughs> it's a damning statement. He was very funny. I got to give it to him. In 2016, Lindsey Graham was hilarious. I, I actually stopped him at one of the conventions or something like that, at the debates, I think. I said to him, I was like, you were by far the best entertainment. We need you on the main stage because it's the only reason why I was watching those secondary debates in 2016. I, don't I, agree I, I, I find the uh, Senator uh, John Kennedy's way of talking just with the foghorn. Yeah, oh, so good. Stick. With all so of good. his analogies. So yeah. good. 
More fun than a pig in slop. <laughs> that does it for us today on Rising. Thanks for tuning in. Let us know if you like the three of us format. We've experimented with that in the past on Rising. We might be doing more of it. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe so you never miss any of our content. And for those of you who like to listen while on the go, we're now available anywhere you can find podcasts. See you later. <laughs>